You're on your way to Revelation, the second chapter. Ah. Uh, That's a long time to pray, isn't it? I've been in prayer meetings that are a whole lot longer than that. But on average, on a Sunday morning service, that's a, that's a pretty healthy amount of time to pray. And I, I just draw your attention to it because, I mean, clearly we wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't, you wouldn't be saying, pray for this person, that person, this situation, unless there was real Christ-given faith to see that moving forward throwing yourself into the hands of your father who you know cares for you. And we have seen time after time after time God answer these prayers. It's like we, that's why I want to hear these praise reports from you guys uh, letting us know what is going on. Maybe we're praying for somebody who does not belong to our church and we don't see this person, but you know them. You know, So we want to hear when God moves in their lives. Uh, and that's encouraging for, for all of us. But a, a church... A church that is a word church, a Bible church like this is, uh, uh, automatically is a praying people. It has to be a praying people. Pray without ceasing, the scripture says. We heard uh, Lynn read out of Romans, the 12th chapter today, about, about being a person of consistent prayer. Just those quick little statements in the 12th chapter uh, of Romans. Anyway, how, how important that is and how critical that is, that uh, prayer really is, is, the, is the conversation um, between yourself and your almighty Father um, that has been provided for us through the cross of Christ. Um, people in the world, they don't have this. And how we need to take advantage of it and go after it hungrily and make it a part of not just a definite time where you sit down and you have time in, in prayer for others, for yourself, for your family, for your pastors, and that's kind of a thing, but also as we move through the day and uh, we, we practice that praying without seeing, ceasing, which is critical. That's the sign of a true believer, a true Christian church that takes prayer seriously. And so uh, I just point that out to you today, that uh, that is something that we don't want to take lightly at any time. Second chapter of Revelation. We're doing part two now of part four. So let's say part four, part B, let's do that uh, in this case, concerning the conditions at Thyatira. Remember, we only got so far last week because this letter is just so full of so many things. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and servants, and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrifice to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, that's death, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. As you look at your outline there, uh, you'll see that from last week we got into the third point, maybe halfway through that third point, so we've got just a little bit left to go. I am not going to do a long review. If you need review, I encourage you to review the YouTube teaching from last Sunday, or you can always download it from off uh, our, our, uh, our website uh, in particular. The Church of Thyatira um, has got uh, a split going on. 
We discovered that last week. Half the church seems to be following the agalos, the messenger, probably the teaching pastor in the church. And the other half seems to be following this woman. At least that's the way it, it seems right here. Uh, they're probably meeting in two different locations. Uh, Christ doesn't uh, pull any punches, does he? He gets right down to business because this is John writing the words of Christ that Christ is, is uh, uh, telling him essentially to, to write to this church. And he's being very direct about this. And uh, because of what I'm going to do now in just a couple of minutes, what I'm about to do in regards to this teaching about, about this woman teaching in a church and what the New Testament has to say about that, that's why, or this is going to be why, I went through and gave you 10 different examples. That's 10 different examples last week concerning women's ministry and how biblical that is on so many levels. We saw that in the first century, women prophesied. They spoke words of encouragement uh, to one another. God would lead them to say certain things, not propositional revelation, but things of an encouragement that would edify and that would build up in regards to Paul's definition of prophecy in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. We saw that that happened also in a judging scenario where there was the prophetess Deborah who judged. There was Huldah, the prophetess, who was there that spoke God's direction to godly King Josiah in the southern kingdom. We noticed in the New Testament that there were women that did the same thing. We saw that Philip the deacon had four daughters and they prophesied. We saw also that Paul writes to Titus and says, while you're setting up churches there on Crete, remember to look out for the older, more experienced Christian ladies to teach the younger, more immature, more inexperienced Christian ladies. And that is to be going on. We saw that there were women who worked directly with the Apostle Paul, uh, Euodiki and Syntyche, who were there in the church at Philippi. And they were having a little bit of a problem together. And Yoke Fellow, that gentleman, was called to bring them back together and get them back into service. And Paul says, they're, they're those who are my co-workers out there uh, in the ministry. One thing I, I didn't point out to you last week in Luke, the, uh, the seventh and the eighth chapter speaks about the ladies that provided of their own sustenance, their own means to uh, help the ministry of Christ and the apostles as the men would travel about all kinds of different opportunities for the ladies to minister. There are only two areas where they are barred that they are not to be involved in. And uh, isn't it fascinating that the only place in all of the New Testament that speaks about a woman teaching men and prophesying over men in this, in this way has to do with this woman named Jezebel that we met last week. And I took you into the Old Testament passages and we saw what a, what a sight this woman, this evil she-devil like one commentator called her really was and how she was married to King Ahab and this was a spineless wonder of a man and she just basically took all of his power and just sort of you know acted like she was in control and he just let it go on and she raised up all these Baal religions and of course God raised up then countered that and raised up Elijah to get on Mount Carmel and Carmel and wipe out 850 of these prophets all at once in a show of great force as the fire came down and God answered by fire and the people said let the God that answers by fire be God and so the fire comes down it eats up the sacrifice and licks up the water that they had poured there and he ate up all of the dust that was all around it and I mean what do you do right I mean God made his statement and yet this woman took it upon herself so foul and, uh, and, and vile she was that she would actually issue a threat to God's chosen man, to the man whom God chose, his prophet, to be his word and threatens him with death the very next day. She kind of got under his skin because he ran, because he ran. But then God brought him back. God re-strengthened him. Eventually, of course, the prophet prophesied about her death. And she did, in fact, die. God raised up one individual. And they threw her down out of her apartment window. And the prophecy was that all that would be left would be her head and her, her palms of her hands and her feet. And the dogs would eat the rest. And that's exactly what took place. 
And Christ pulls no punches when he speaks about this woman and how that the church itself had tolerated her, starting there in verse 20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. As I told you before, I don't think this was her actual name. Once again, Revelation 1.1 tells us these things are signified to us. And so I think that this is the nature and character of this woman. Definitely was a female, and she was not to be in this position in any way, shape, or form. Who does she lead astray? The text says that she leads my bond servants astray. Middle of verse 20. She calls herself a prophetess, so she's self-called. That means nobody else is in any authority is recognizing that except the people who are following her. She then teaches and leads my servants, doulos, astray. Who are these? Well, it's the men of the church. Say, how do you know that? Because doulos here is a masculine. There's, there's a, we should be understanding it as precisely that when it shows up, the masculine gender shows up in the word in this way, that the men are submitting to her. We've got, we've got a repeat of the garden going on here where Adam submitted himself to Eve as she was deceived, the text says, in more than one place. And they took of the fruit that God said not to eat of. So Adam submits to that, and, now, and that brought on the curse. And now here comes this curse that's coming on these Thyatira people. Now, here's what I want to do, and I think it's very important that we do this. So I want to take just a little bit of time now to do this. And then we're going to, I'll do my best to make it through uh, the rest of this text here without, uh, without you know, pressuring you you know, too much in regards to, to too much time, because I don't want to overwhelm you. However, I don't want you to miss out on what God wants you to have today, too. So what I want to do is I want to ask you this question. In light of the fact that we have this woman, Jezebel, doing what she do, she's doing, and maybe really what this is, as I play devil's advocate for a moment, maybe really what this is, is this is just, this could have been a man, for that matter, who is teaching the people of God there in Thyatira, you know, that fornication is okay. That forms of sacrificial eating to idols is okay. I mean, a man could have done this, right? Really, isn't the issue here of uh, the content of what she was teaching as opposed to, you know, her gender? Well, just yesterday I was watching this thing on, on uh, this little commercial here for some Christian movie, and it's all about you know, these, the disaster of pastors, you know, uh, in, in, in various denominations. And they're having interviews with, with different pastors in different denominations. And some of these were women, you know, women pastors. And they're all dressed up like the men, and they got their collars on, and they got their stoles on, and, and doing that whole kind of a thing. And, you know, the more we see this, and, and the more that it goes on, the more we are infected with being convinced by what we see and be, as being truth, as opposed to what we read as being truth the truth. And I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we get back to what God says so that people don't have to die because of our insane, insane selfishness that we run with uh, so often. I'm going to have you slip over to 1 Timothy quickly, please. 1 Timothy. You can get yourself back to Revelation in just a minute. And I want you to see something here. 1 Timothy now. And I want you to look at chapter 3, and I want you to look at uh, verse 15. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, because Paul had to speak to this scenario uh, to Timothy, who is the pastor of the church at Ephesus there in Asia Minor. I want you to see, first of all, in 1 Timothy 3.15, what the general uh, tenor of the epistle is all about and why Paul wrote this to Timothy. The general tenor of the epistle is about the church and how uh, Timothy in particular, as the, as the pastor, is to conduct and order the church when the church gathers together. 3.15, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So I'm writing to you for what reason? So you know how to conduct yourself in the church. By conducting yourself, you'll see as you go through reading this epistle that it has everything to do with how we do church, how God wants church to be done. 
people in ministry offices, who they are and why uh, uh, they are in these positions. The context of what I want to show you, and I'm going to have you read it real quick, uh, what I basically want to show you, and then I'll give you the context, is down in chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. Take a look at it. Chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, 11 through 15. Paul says, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into the transgression. But women will be preserved or saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now, I want you to see the context. We've already seen that the main statement or theme of the reason for the epistle is how to do church. How Timothy is to conduct himself in the church, pillar and ground of the truth, chapter 3, verse 15. You look at the top of chapter 2, and he begins by speaking about how public prayer is to take place when the church comes together. Gee, that's why we did what we did today. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, he says, First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings, for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Who's supposed to be leading that? Look down at verse 8. Verse 8. Therefore, I want the what? Men in every place to pray. In every place where the church at Ephesus meets is what that means. I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So the men are in the front in regards to leading prayer. That's why the elders step up here to, to help lead us uh, in prayer. And then, if you look down at verse 9, he talks about, he brings the women into it. He says how women are to dress and present themselves in the, in the public gathering. You look at verses 9 and 10, for instance. He says, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly, discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. So he's, he's uh, basically saying, uh, uh, he's speaking against the sexual mores and the habitual dress that went on in the Greco-Roman society, especially in Asia Minor right here, re relative to provocativeness in dress. Um, let it be modest is what he's talking about. Not drawing attention to oneself or one's bodily parts uh, in that feminine persuasion. He's not saying you can't wear certain kinds of jewelry. He's telling you don't emphasize the kind of jewelry that draws attention to you relative to look how much moolah I got. And by the way, they would take uh, pearls, pearls very costly. They would, uh, some of the more wealthier women would have the long nails and have pearls attached to the nails. Besides, they would also weave strands of gold and pearls into their hair, into the braiding. He says, don't do that. You're saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Okay? Because there's something beautiful he wants to talk about, all, all about women and the way, that they, the way that they are and the way God has made them to be. Now, remember, what he's about to say here has, to, has everything to do, because we just read it, has everything to do with the fall and what took place uh, in the garden. Then notice here, because I want you to see context, you look down at chapter 3 and really verses 1 through 13, which I'm not going to read uh, all the way through for you, has to do with qualification for elders, also known as overseers, who are also known as pastors, as well as qualifications for deacons. And if you look through it, even just in English, um, the Greek shows it uh, a lot more uh, 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 with a lot more detail, but, but the masculine qualifiers that are throughout this, for for instance, verse 1, it's a trustworthy statement, 3-1, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, overseer there is in the masculine gender, it is a fine work he desires to do, an overseer, masculine gender, he goes on to be above reproach, the husband of one wife, not the wife of one husband. Uh, he is to be a, the Greek reads, he is to be a one woman man, one woman man. And the idea is just like Christ is a one woman savior. He has one church he loves. So, so the one who represents Christ, the elder, the overseer, the pastor, is to be 
a one-woman man. And he, and he moves on. Bottom of verse 2, he is to have the ability to teach. Deacons don't, aren't called for that. Elders, overseers, pastors are called to that. And he moves on with the masculine gender through that. He does the exact same thing with the deacons. On the other hand, having seen the context, you can see now the surrounding of what is being discussed here in regards to ministry and, and the place that the men have. And then he brings up the women in 9 and 10. Then he gets down to it in verse 11. And I want you to focus on this. He says, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Uh, the will and direction of God for our ladies... When the church comes together, 315, right? How to conduct yourself in the household of God. Yes? All right. 211 now. When the church comes together, God says, I want the ladies to quietly receive instruction. It's isukia for quietly. Isukia. It means a tranquility, a peacefulness that is happening, a state of rest, a state of of calm learning. But that word tranquil is really important right there. Now when he says, verse 11, quietly receive instruction, that's mantaneto. Mantaneto is one who, it's exactly what it says, he receives instruction. She is a learner. By the way, mantaneto here is present tense and it's imperative in its mood. So we have a command here, and he wants the ongoing action to be always regularly this way, that the ladies must always regularly receive this quiet tranquility in regards to their instruction. She is to be being instructed, not giving instruction, he says. And this is in the church. Now what about, I'm going to hit this really quick. Wait a minute, Pastor. Whoa! Wait a minute! What about uh, Acts 18? What about Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos? It says, and you've showed us this before, you showed us that it says that they took him aside and they taught him the way of God more perfectly. That's right, they did. There's no problem with that. There's no problem with meeting down at Starbucks, unless you don't want to give any money to that situation. <laughs> There's no problem with meeting down at Village Inn and sitting down having a little coffee and a man and his wife and another male-female couple or whatever like that have a little Bible study. I'm, I'm, my wife is loaded with information and I want her to share it. We're not in church. This is not an office scenario. This is not how God... Uh, relative to this aspect of running the church, this is not some rebuke that she can't go out there and share what the word means by what it says, no. But when it comes to filling a place in the church, 1 Timothy 3.15, this is how you do church. That in the church, she is not to be in a position where she is teaching. Rather, she is to be the taught. And verse 11b says that it's with an entire submissiveness. An entire submissive. To who? To her instructor. To who? Well, who's instructing her? Well, who do you think? <laughs> it's chapter 3, and it's verse 1, and it's verse 2. It's the overseer, the one who is, has the ability to teach. And she is to be instructed in regards to that. Look at verse 12. He says, but I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. I do not allow a woman to teach. Uc epitrepo. Present tense for epitreo. I never allow it. It is an abiding attitude the present tense talks about. I don't allow it regularly or consistently. Don't allow what? For her to teach. or to exercise the authority over a man, but to remain quiet, to remain tranquil. Now Jezebel, back there in Revelation 2 and verse 20, she's teaching, isn't she? She's leading the men, the doulos, the masculine doulos. Already this is going on. Isn't it interesting that there's no examples anywhere in the New Testament of a woman teacher, or a woman elder, or a woman deacon? Why? Because of this text right here. That's why. And you'll never see it. Now, when you have church, some people think, you know, to hear a teaching like this, for me to stress something like this. First of all, if you're a woman and you're feeling uncomfortable by this, 
Why? Submit. Not to me. Submit to Christ through the word. That's all. This is health. This is healthy. There is not a single church anywhere on this earth where women are leading that that church is healthy. It is in sin. It is in a desperate level of sin. It is in the type of sin that brought us into sin in the first place. Because what happened in the Garden of Eden is Adam turned around and submitted himself to his wife. Now you and I have read that and read that and studied that passage over and over and over again. And because of that scenario, there comes, a, there comes that submissive uh, situation that is put upon Eve and all of Eve's sisters that follow after that, that he speaks about there in Genesis, the, the third chapter. And I'm trying to move this along so we don't get too bogged down here. Notice verse 12. I don't allow a woman to teach or exercise authority. Uh, authentain is our Greek word for exercising authority. It's a present active infinitive. Once again, the present tense is important. It's a static present. Once again, it's an abiding sort of situation. She is not to exercise authority. This is to be continuous. Now, an authentane is somebody who's an autocrat. It's somebody who domineers, who has a dominating type of um, job, if you will, or a dominating type of expression. Expositor's Greek Testament, Volume 4 says this about this word here. An authentes is one who acts on their own authority. What did Jezebel say about herself? She calls herself a prophetess and leads and teaches the males, the male servants. Vincent's Word Studies in the New Testament, Volume 4, page 225, quote, one who does a thing with his own hand. But instead, she is to, verse 12 at the bottom, remain quiet. There's that word uh, uh, again, uh, isukia. She is to be in a state of tranquility. Remain quiet. Refers back to the end of, of verse 11. Isn't that fabulous? She is to be located in a tranquil silence, in a place of learning. Now look at verse 13. Four. Here's two reasons. People say, why is it this way? You know. Well, Paul gives two reasons why it is this way. Verse 13. Four. Number one reason, it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. So you have a creatorship priority. Now, he could have created the woman first, but he didn't. That would have been interesting. We took some time to be in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter quickly. I, I think it was Wednesday night. I, I don't remember now. But it talks about the fact of the submission order, how that the woman is in submission under the man. The man is in submission under Christ, and it had to do with head coverings. And we'll deal with that with more detail when we, when we get to it. You know? But the woman, it says, was created for the man, not the man for the woman. And that's correct in accordance with Genesis. The second reason that a woman is not to teach or exercise authority. By the way, anytime you sit under somebody and you listen, to their teaching, you're receiving their authority. So you have to be careful who you're sitting under. You have to be careful. Second reason is verse 14. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into the transgression. Now the Greek, by giving it being deceived, points towards the idea that she was in a state of deception. Eve was, Eve was in a state of deception after being uh, in, in the presence of the person of Satan in the, in the, in the garden there in the guise of the, the serpent. So she was in this state of being deceived. And she consequently fell into the transgression. So because of her falling into the transgression, and then Adam, dumb, just submits to her, throws the whole thing on its head, reverses everything, that's why things are, are the way they are. So in the church, there cannot be this teaching prerogative of, of women. It's a curse, ladies and gentlemen. It cannot be this way. It's not healthy. It's very unhealthy. And it leads directly to the type of scenario that we are dealing with uh, here in, uh, in Revelation, the second chapter, which I'm going to have you go back to now. So, looking at verse 20, let's move along here. A woman who teaches the church to compromise is what comes up next. Now, I'm going to kick it into gear here, so just run with me, all right? 
She calls herself a prophetess, verse 20, teaches and leaves my bondservants astray. Well, what is this now? What is she doing? What, what happens? What is this arena of compromise? So that they, two things, commit acts of immorality, eat things, sacrifice uh, to idols. Uh, a porneos is what we've got going here. That's, that's all it is in Greek. What she's doing is she's leading them to porneos. Now, there's two kinds of, of porneos. And Jezebel was known, of course, for her literal sexual proclivities and her ungodliness relative to porneos and relative to idolatry. But the word porneos, and we'll see it later on in Revelation 2, has two meanings to it. Number one, there can be the literal aspect of an individual who has sex with someone somebody that they are not married to, and that person is not married to somebody else. That is fornication in its primary sense. The secondary meaning has to do with unfaithfulness, and this is what, what, how the word is largely used in the book of Revelation. She is here teaching them, because she is a woman, number one, because she is a woman, number one, that pulls back into it, because what did the text say in 1 Timothy 2.14? that she was in a state of deception. And so we have the proclivity of a woman being deceived more often than not than a man would be deceived. This is what Paul is saying when he says the woman is in a state of deception, or one commentator said, in a state of easy deceivableness. And so there is a proclivity towards unfaithfulness and to eat things, secondly, sacrifice to idols. Now, we've already covered this in 1 Corinthians 8, didn't we? And we made reference to it in Romans, the 14th chapter. That is not the kind of scenario that's being talked about there, where in 1 Corinthians 8 and, Re and 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, excuse me, Romans 14, where he is saying that those who are strong in faith can eat anything. It doesn't matter if this thing has been, you know, given over to some sort of an idol like they did uh, back then, and then it was resold. And, you know, he, Paul's saying it's just good hamburger. However, if somebody thinks it's sin, that they eat of this, and they actually think that they will be inhabited by a demon, then for them it is sin. So we want to be careful in regards to that. Well, that is not what's being talked about right here. What was being talked about right here is actual worship to demons. See, that's the meaning here. When you look at 1 Corinthians, and you look at the 10th chapter, this aspect of actually worshiping a demon... You look at 1 Corinthians 10, 19, and 20. This is what Paul or John is talking about that is going on in the Thyatira church. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 20. Paul says, what do I mean? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things with the gen which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. I suggest strongly to you that that is what is being discussed here and pointed at in Revelation 2 at the end of verse 20 that she teaches them, the men, to eat things sacrificed to demons. That there is involvement actually with the demonic right here. And I cannot assure you that that also would not be going on in churches right now here in Omaha where women are leading congregations. I think it's dangerous. I think it opens the door to the demonic. Not only is this a woman who teaches the church to compromise, but it's a woman who refuses to repent. Look at this in 21. He says, I gave her time to repent. Kronos is the Greek word for time. That's a period of time. That's a, an occasion of time specifically given for her to repent. I, I, I opened up this arena of time that was just for her. I handed that over without a change of nature, and she's saying no. How do I know that? Because it says I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her porneos. Of her porneos. Um, in 2 Timothy... In 2 Timothy and chapter 2, at the end, verse 25 and 26, talks about the, the Lord's bondservant is to be quarrelsome, kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Watch. If perhaps, 
if perhaps God may grant them, give them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So first you've got the idea of perhaps repentance is granted. Perhaps repentance is given. In other words, it might be, it might not be. That's up to the Lord. That's a sovereign decision on his part. But notice that if it is given, then 26 says that they may come to their senses. See, this is a senseless thing. Any kind of sin in scripture that's spoken of, and clearly a woman teaching men in the congregation, after you've had that instruction, clearly that is sin. It is to go against what scripture says. But that's something that women and men who are listening to that need to come to their senses over. It's a senseless thing in God's kingdom. And we are to understand that this is a snare or a trap of the devil. See, that's why I don't hesitate saying to you, it's demonic. It's a trap of the devil. And they're held captive by him to do his will. In particular now, of course, when 2 Timothy was written, and he was around, still running around like a lion, but now, of course, since AD 70, in the lake of fire. Nevertheless, the demonics still have their ability to do this and to carry this kind of a thing out. It's very incredible. Looking back at, at uh, 21, it says she does not want to repent. Chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 21. She's never had a change of nature is what this is pointing out. That's why she doesn't repent. She doesn't have a change of nature. Isn't that interesting? He gave her time to repent. He gave it to her. But that, only, that will only have its effect when somebody has a new nature, when they're born again. This woman, not born again. Of course, you already figured that one out for yourself. You didn't need me to tell you that. What's the condition of these men in the church that are following after her? Not the whole church is following after her, but some of the church, some of the males are following after her. You know why they're following after her? Because she's sexually attractive. Her theme is porneos and idolatry. The idolatry also includes the fact of worshiping a God being led by someone that God's own word says is not to be doing any leading and you've got an idolatrous situation because there's no way that that individual is leading you in worship to the one true God. It's idolatry. And the demonic are involved. And they've been taken captive by the snare of the devil. That's how serious this is. Which brings us to verse 22. He says that she is also a woman of judgment who will be judged. He says in 22, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Throw her on a bed of sickness. In other words, her judgment is actually connected to the sin itself. That's why the, the picture here of a bed, that which used to produce a source of pleasure, will now be a source of pain and judgment. And those who, what about those who follow her? That's her. What about those who follow her? Those who commit adultery? That's a, uh, that's a death penalty act, right, on the Old Testament text. Those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Those who follow women teachers will participate in their judgment, is our context here. Now, great tribulation, I want you to see this in light of the book of Revelation. I want you to see the eschatology here. This is talking about the three and a half years, time, time, half a time, um, uh, AD 66 to AD 70, great tribulation that Jesus spoke to, referring to his tribulation, the great, in the Olivet Discourse, in which this entire book of Revelation is all about. It's all about the three and a half year judgment. From AD 66 to AD 70, where the overthrow, the changing out of the old covenant took place and the bringing in of the new covenant took place. And at the end of it, the parousia takes place and the closing or fulfilling, the closing down of the salvation program is finally taking place uh, at that moment. I'm going to skip some things here because I'm sort of running out of time here, if you don't mind. Next, I, it, she is a woman who brings the church into judgment, and that's where we start looking at verse 
23, and he says, and I will kill her with pestilence. It's actually the Greek word for death. I will kill her with death. Interesting. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Here's the Lord. This is the Lord of glory. He's saying, I will kill her. You ever heard God talk like that before? I will kill her. You heard that? Jesus saying he's going to, oh my gosh. But the scripture does back that up in a number of places. You see, what's happening here is that this woman does not have the right to live on this earth anymore. Those who commit this type of physical slash spiritual porneos and adultery, they forfeit their right to be on the earth. It's a horrible thing. But this is what's backing this up when he says, I will kill her. Matter of fact, you might want make a note of Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39 God says, see now that I am he, there is no God besides me, and I will put to death. It is I who put to death, excuse me, and give life. I have wounded. It is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. It is I who put to death. It is I who heal. 1 Samuel 2.6 says things very similar to that. 1 Samuel 2.6. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Acts the 5th chapter and the 5th and the 10th verses. When they lied to the Holy Spirit concerning the amount of money that they said they, they gave when they sold their property like other people were doing. They could have held on to the money. They could have kept it. They didn't have to. They could have given the portion and said that's the portion that they gave. But instead they gave the smaller portion. But they said in front of everybody so they could get the credit that they gave the larger amount. Something along those lines. They sought the credit. They sought the glory. And that took them out. That was a death penalty issue for them, and God took them out because of it. What about the folks in, in Corinth? 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 29 and 32. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 29 through 32, talks about those who were abusing the Lord's table. And you know, some were sick, and some had died. Paul says to them, when we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Discipline in that matter right there. He says he'll kill, verse 23, their children with death. So their followers that are being birthed into this are, are being born um, as dead children, as it were. And then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds. All the churches will. So this is a warning to all the churches, not just the church of Thyatira. All churches need to be aware of this. You don't tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Apparently, some churches aren't listening anymore. He says, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4 is very direct in regards to that. And I'll give each to each one of you according to your deeds. Well, what are the deeds of the people? At least half will say of this church who are following Jezebel. What are these deeds? Well, verse 20 says it's porneas and it's idolatry, right? Porneas and idolatry. You don't have any of that going, do you? So I have to do pastoral work at some point here, and I have to ask you this question. You don't do that, do you? He says, he says, and I will, at the bottom of 23, give to each one of you according to your deeds. What will he give? What did he give to them? Well, first of all, he, did so, he gave something very gracious to this woman. Verse 21, what was it? Verse 21. Time to repent. Time to repent. See? He gives time to repent. But what else? When she doesn't repent, verse 22, throwing her into a bed of sickness, yes. And then finally, the beginning of 23, I will kill her children with death. So he gives death in these regards. This is how serious this matter is. 
Fourth point. Fourth point on your outline. Moving along here. Let's talk about the condition of those who refuse to compromise. All right, here's the high end. Here's, 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 the, here's the encouraging part. Now we want to talk about the people who are following the agalos, the messenger. They're not following Jezebel. What about these other people? I mean, they're in the church too. They're hearing all of this. This is being read to all of them. And, you know, you're sitting there in the church and the one thing you're probably asking is, I'm not following her, but it sounds like this is going to include us too. Is this going to include us too? Are we going to get nailed along with all these other... No, God is just. Just like when uh, God approached Abraham and told him he was going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, what did Abraham say? Will the God of all the earth not do what is right? Surely you're not going to take out the righteous with the wicked. And of course, God doesn't do that. He doesn't take out the righteous with the wicked. You ever hear about a little thing called the flood? Noah's Ark? See? But he wants them to, to understand one thing at the top of verse 24, that there is a condition of no further burden that he wants to place on them. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. He's busy telling them what they're not involved with and removing further burdens from them. And so... Who are we talking to here? Top of 24. But I say to you, now he defines who the you are, the, the plural pronoun. I say to all of you, you are the rest who are in Thyatira. The rest, uh, those who are under the Agalos and not under Jezebel, who do not hold, it says, to this teaching, the teaching of Porneas and idolatry. Uh, who do not hold to what is called the deep things of Satan as they call them. See, apparently there was this teaching series that she was doing. <laughs> and it's called the deep things of Satan series. And... Uh, <clears throat> See, now this really, this really outs her for, for what's going on here in regards to the content, besides you know her feminine situation, but the content right here. See, the deep things of Satan, just like, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, there are the deep things of God, there is the counterfeit, on the other hand. There's the deep things of Satan. And the deep things of Satan, what this was, actually implied uh, within Gnostic uh, arenas. And these were people who, who didn't believe that Jesus came in a body, that believed that God is too holy and would never uh, take on human flesh because that would, that would uh, defile him in some way. And this is, this is the essence of, of Gnosticism in any case. And they also believed that, the, that the, the teachings known as the deep things of Satan, they're actually was a teaching known as the deep things of Satan uh, and it had to do with uh, those who were initiated uh, into this and those who were not and this was coming into the church that only certain ones could understand. They would be special type of believers initiated uh, into these deep things of Satan. The depths, that phrase, the depths, was a Gnostic phrase later coined by the Gnostics to describe their teachings. And in the first century, there were these esoterics that held, listen to this, that a truly spiritual man should know and actually take part in heathen life and in their community and in the idolatry and in the porneos because the truly spiritual man in Gnostic deep thinking would be essentially unaffected by any of this. They ought to know it and that they would actually be benefited by going through this negativity and get this knowledge gained by this experience that supposedly you got from the depths or the deep things of Satan. And this thing was actually going on right there in the church. That was part of Jezebel's teaching. But then he says at the end of verse 24, to the rest of you, even though they're doing this, but you have not participated in this because you have not done these things, then th what I have for you is I will place no other burden on you. Implying that there is more of a spiritual burden that could be placed on genuine believers. But this is enough for them to know. In other words, I'm not giving you more than you can handle. 
I'm not, I'm not blowing you out of the water. I'm not 1 Corinthians 10-13-ing um, uh, 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 you that God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested more than you're able to bear but will, will with the testing make a way of escape so you can bear up under it. He, notice he doesn't tell them to get out. He doesn't tell them to get out. I think what he's saying to him, to them right there is maintain. He's telling the agalos here to maintain. I think he's saying take things back. I place no other burden on you. And by the way, there's a condition that's coming at you right here. Another condition in verse 25. And it's something about experiencing Christ's coming that they are to look forward to. They can look forward to this. Notice what he says. He doesn't tell them to go leave the church, but he says in 25, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast, hold fast, hold on to it, grip tight, for how long? Until I come. And of course, the Thyatira church and these people from 2,000 years ago are still over there in Asia Minor. They're still there and they're still holding tight, right? Because Jesus hasn't come back yet. Hello? Right? Mm -hmm. huh? huh? Yeah. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Once again, there is that expectation that they were encouraged to have. Hold fast until I come. Um. Keep in mind that we've got a whole scenario uh, in the New Testament of the timing of Christ's coming and the apostles' teaching of that coming. Oh, of course they were going to experience it. And of course only those who would experience it in the first century will be told to hold fast until I come. You know, I don't know where it came from. I've said this to you before. But that teaching... That, that, that uh, I have no idea where it came from, that all believers of all generations for the last 2,000 years are supposed to have this attitude that Christ could come in their, in their generation. I don't know where it came from, but it's a lie, and it's not true. The Bible teaches that nowhere. There is no text anywhere about that. The only time where God says something like this to people are to people in the first century, pre-AD 70, every time. And all of these books in the New Testament were all written pre-AD 70, every one of them. What did Jesus say in Matthew 10, 23? He says to the boys, as he's getting ready to send them out to evangelize, you're, going to get, you're not going to get through all of the cities of Israel before I return. So interpret that for me. It means exactly what you think it means. It's not one of those stick it on the shelf things like we used to do. It's like, well, we, that can't mean that. That's got to mean something else. So I'll just put that on the shelf and smile because my pastor says something else. Kind of, a, You're not going to get through all the cities of Israel till I come back. There's only one second coming. There's only one return he ever talked about. Matthew 16, 27 through 28. You know this. Matthew 16, 27 through 20, to 28. That the kingdom of God is about to take place, he says. Mellow using that verb right there. The kingdom of God is about to. And some of you standing here, he says to the people of the first century, some of you standing here will not taste of death till you see me coming in my kingdom. See, people who try to get out of the obviousness of that try to make that the Mount of Transfiguration event in the 17th chapter. The problem is, is none of the events that he talks about in the Mount of Transfiguration are what he talks about in 16 verses 27 and 28. None of those things are there. They try to say the Mount of Transfiguration is some sort of a preview of the second coming. It's not. According to Luke's version, in Luke the ninth chapter, he says that Moses and Elijah appeared unto Jesus specifically to discuss what? His crucifixion that was about to take place. There's nothing of the second coming in there. There's no angels there. There's no giving away of, of, uh, of, of reward and judgment like that. And how many of the apostles were dead when the amount of transfiguration took place? Which ones were dead? See, it just doesn't stop, does it, folks? It just doesn't stop. In Matthew 26 and verse 64 trying to race here. 26 verse 64, Jesus is standing in front of the Sanhedrin. They got him on trial. <laughs> he says to them, and all of you, using the plural pronoun, all of you will see the Son of Man coming on clouds in power and glory. They rip their 
their, uh, their, their togas. They ripped their robes right there saying he's blasphemed, right? Because they understood that that was a Hebraism. Only God comes with clouds. Only God comes with clouds, Isaiah 19, and other passages like that. Gosh, the apostles' teaching, Paul himself, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17. I'm going to give it to you. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17. <laughs> he says, For we say unto all of you by the word of the Lord, listen, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Oh, let's read that again. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. This is the so-called rapture passage. What an abortion that is. <laughs> There's the people, it's like they're so such in a hurry to get, you know, to beam me up, Scotty, that they miss this. We who are alive and remain. We, we, we. Who's the we? Well, that's Paul, and that's the Thessalonians. He's writing to them. We who are alive, alive alive and remain still here still here until when until what the coming of the Lord the Greek word there is parousia it's the arrival with the consequential presence and then he repeats it 17 then we who are alive and remain will be seized not caught up it's 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 seized together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so shall we always be so you say did that happen yeah it happened Air right, the word there, for air right there is not Uranus, it's not heaven, it's not the sky above where the birds are flying around and the clouds are, it's, it's not that. It's ear, it's, it sounds like ear on the side of your head. It means the place of respiration, it's used in several places in the New Testament that's talking about the inner area of the spiritual arena of man. It's the ear. How come I never heard of this before? Well, welcome, I guess. I've been here for how long have I been here? How long has this church been going on? You know, it's all, I'm all over the internet. I'm not the only one talking this way. It's just that people are limited. There's loads of books out there that, that talk about this, speak about this. There's tons of authors throughout the history of the church. It shouldn't be a problem. Gosh, there are so many things here. I'm so frustrated. 523. Now may God... May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit, soul, and body, 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 be preserved, complete, without blame, at the parousia coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Body be preserved at the coming of the Lord. It means exactly what you think it means. Don't shelve it. It's exactly what you think it means. I mean again and again and again. And I'm skipping all kinds of passages here. Why don't you write down Hebrews 10.37. You can look at it later. Hebrews 10.37. Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 9.28. James 5. 7-9. through 9. Philippians 4.5. The Lord is at hand. Philippians 4, 5. Egus is the Greek behind at hand. It, it means as close as your hand. Everybody look at their hand. The Lord is at hand. He's as close, Paul says, he's at hand. Well, yeah, he wants every generation to load the gun, put it to the head, and just pull that trigger. It, 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 gets, it gets bad. Okay, almost done. Because i got to finish, because i got to move along. You know what I'm saying? Verse 26. There's a condition for overcomers. Look, they get the overcoming promise now. He who overcomes. See, don't run away. Hold fast until I come. He who overcomes. And he who keeps my deeds unto the end. To him I will give authority over the nations. He who overcomes is the honikon. Honikon. This is the one who has the foot on the neck of the enemy. And in this case, the foot on the neck of Jezebel. Foot on the neck. And he who keeps my deeds, my works unto the end. To keep is tereo. It's to guard like a soldier. Uh, walking walking the, uh, the perimeter as it were. Gosh, skip, skip that too. Skip that. Skip that. He who keeps my deeds until the end. Um, I... I, I I don't think that's in reference to the end as in the parousia. I think that's in reference to the end of your life. And I would refer you to Hebrews 3.6, Hebrews 3.6, Hebrews 
and Hebrews 6, 11. That's Hebrews 3, 6, 14, and 6, 11. 26, he who overcomes, he who keeps my deeds until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. That's a direct quote, nearly a direct quote, out of Psalm 2, verses 8 through 9. Psalm 2, verses 8 through 9, and that is a messianic psalm, and that promise is made to Christ. And here Christ takes this promise, and he says, I'm going to share this with you. I'm going to share this co-rulership with you over the nations. And by the way, by the way, this is not yet to happen. This has been happening for the church since A.D. 70, since Christ returned. Every person that gets born into the kingdom since that time is placed into this position. Well, I've never heard of that before. Well, of course you haven't. It's been kept from you. One of the most powerful things that has kept churches alive and kept denominations running is this myth that you're going to experience the coming of the Lord. That he's still coming. And that's why people say, you're taking my blessed hope away. You're taking my hope away. Read that. Read Titus 2, verse 11 through 13. And you'll find out that Titus says that the blessed hope belonged to Paul and Titus. That's what Paul said. It belongs to us. How is it that I'm taking your hope away if I'm telling you that Jesus is here? And he's ruling, and he's reigning. And guess what? You are too, but you just don't take any action because you're not convinced he's here. If you don't think he's here, you won't behave like he's here. Let me show you how you're supposed to behave. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Look at verse 13. Daniel 7, verse 13. Here's the parousia prophesied. He says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, Matthew 26, 64, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Say, what does that have to do with me? Look down at 18. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. The saints of the highest one. When 13 and 14 takes place, which is a reference to the parousia, then 18 follows. Look at verse 22. Until the ancients of day, actually 21, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints. That horn, that horn there is a reference to Nero, with the saints and overpowering them. So that brings us right back into the first century from AD 66 uh, up close to AD 70. Until the ancient of days came, that's the father, right, from from verse 13, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Hold your spot right there. Don't move from it. When the saints took possession of the kingdom. Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay every man according to their deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of you who standing here who will not taste death, until they see the Son of Man coming in His, in His glory. Thanks, kingdom. <laughs> That's okay, I love you. <laughs> coming in His kingdom. Now listen to this again. And the time arrived, Daniel 7, 22, when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Uh, looking back at 18. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. 27. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Now that takes place over time. That takes place over history. For sure that does. But since AD 70, this is the reality. He is here. The saints have been given the kingdom and you're complaining about losing some money at work? And we're freaking out along with the rest of the world about our insurance and Obamacare is going to kill. We need to wake up. 
We need to wake up and we need to do privately and personally just what we did here just a little bit ago and start assaulting heaven with prayer and seeking God and using the name of Christ because Jesus is here and he is ready to do. You know what the deeds of Jesus are that we're supposed to be doing? According to John 14, I'm off the reservation now. According to John 14 and verse 11, Jesus says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise believe because of the works themselves. Remember, we're doing his deeds. Here it comes. Amen, amen, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Raising the dead, multiplying fish. Oh, now wait a minute. Oh, now you wait a minute. What? Demonstrate how I am not exegeting, exegeting this properly. Then you can stop me. Keep in mind who, who, who is hearing this right now. Guess who's going to be judged for what he says. If I take this and water this down, guess who's going to be judged. If I change this into anything else other than what it says, guess who's going to be judged for that. His name starts with a K and it ends with a D for dude. <laughs> amen, amen, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater than these he will do, because I go to the Father. How, how does that happen? 13, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That, that, that oh, good, oh, Mercedes Benz, here I come. No, no, no flesh pot, no. This is about, why did Jesus do his works? To magnify the Father for the sake of ministry. We ask him to do things for the sake of ministry. He says, for these people who overcome, guess what you get? You get the morning star. You seeing it there at the end? He says, for those who overcome, they get the morning star. 22.16 says that's Christ. And he who has an ear, let him hear. He better hear what the Spirit says to the church is. He who has an ear. Physical? Is that what he means? No, he means can you understand what I'm saying here? If you understand what I'm saying here, you better listen. Pay attention to what the Spirit is saying to the church is. So we don't tolerate the Jezebel thing. Right? Because to do so is to involve yourself with the demonic. And for those of you who aren't following after that failed system, who has the deep things of Satan teaching series running day and night, hold fast, he says, until I come. Hold fast until I come. All right, but that was then. And this is now. Now what? Well, last time I checked, the word of the Lord abides forever. And when he says, no, the ladies are supposed to be in a position of quiet, tranquil learning. You know why? Because, and I've said this before, men, listen very carefully to me. You've probably heard me say this once before. I'm going to say it uh, again. The ladies are the most precious thing on the planet. For men, for us men, there's nothing more important than watching after the ladies and covering them, and protecting them, and taking care of them, and ministering to them, to your wife first. Children come after that. Children come after that. Children are important, but children come after that for us men. See? That's why we don't send women to do men's work, like war on a battlefield. They stay home. I didn't even finish that passage for you. Oh, frustration. <clears throat> Here, I'll stop with this. I appreciate you hanging in there with me like this. In 1 Timothy 2, he says in verse 15, Look, women will be preserved, sozo, saved, delivered, through the bearing of children, if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. See, this is great. Women will be saved. Saved from what? Well, saved from um, exercising authority over a man. Taking the te teaching position away. 
You'll be delivered from that. You'll be delivered from that if you live in accordance with the will of God for you to live. And one of those ways is through the bearing of children. The married women, men can't do that. And you women, I know, who have children, you say, yeah, I wish you could because, you know, then you know. and Don't touch me, don't touch me. <laughs> but God made it that way. Only you ladies can do that. Bring another life into the world. They'll, they're delivered when they fall into that area that they're supposed to fall into. If they continue in faith. The woman of faith doesn't use, usurp the authority of the teaching arm of the church. In love, a woman who loves doesn't do that. Sanctity, a woman who is sancti sanctified, holy, separated unto the Lord, doesn't teach or exercise authority over a man. She exercises self-restraint. Few and far between are those who will listen to something like this, especially in, um, especially in our current political social climate here in the United States. I'll probably get, I'll probably hear about this. So, Father, we just give you all the praise and glory and thanks for all that you have shown us today, Lord. It's been hard, Lord. It's been, uh, it's been necessarily strong as we've moved through this uh, short epistle uh, to the church of Thyatira. But Lord, we ask that you would be uh, magnified and lifted up and glorified through all that was stated today. Uh, Lord, I, I trust that you keep me from error. And where I err, Lord, please show me. I will repent, O oh Father. Lord God, and I thank you for the mercies that you have given me and have given to this congregation. For as long as this congregation has been around, Lord, I thank you for the mercies that you have shown to us over the years. And I ask, Lord, that you do strengthen us and help us to take very seriously your presence here. And our response to that presence as those who have had the kingdom handed over to them, O oh God, that we might live by faith that walks in the truth and the reality that Christ is here and that I am called to do the very works that he has done to the glory of the Father so that the ministry of Christ goes forward unto those who are still here locked in this lost and dying system. Thank you, Lord, for these things today. And I ask, Lord God, that uh, your blessing would remain huge upon your people. And as we turn to give now, Lord, to the work of the ministry, may your people be blessed back a hundred times. Lord God, that as they give, uh, that it shall be given back to them, as it says in Luke. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing us as we worship you with our finances, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go ahead, Deacon Lynn.